What's up and welcome back to Gabe Miller Music. And to answer the question that you're probably already thinking, this is temporary and not really right for the genres of techno and trance adjacent stuff that we're going to be walking through today. But if I want to make something that's kind of nightclub and night city styled, I may as well dress the part and it's fun for me. So just roll with it. Speaking of dressing the part, though, if you like this shirt, it's uh, linked in the description. It's one of the shirts that we sell. But that tangent aside, let's actually get into the circuits. So first of all, the setup. And I'll get hands on with the circuits in a second. But the circuit rhythm is the master device here. And it's controlling elements of the circuit tracks. And then the circuit tracks audio is being piped back into the rhythm. I've run this exact setup before and I did a dedicated video really picking apart the kind of mechanics of how that works. So I'll link that at the end of this video if you're interested in that. Here, I want to focus a lot more on building up a live set in kind of the techno and trance adjacent spaces. So I'm going to focus on layering, making something that is continuous, tips and tricks I've picked up along the way, and answers to the questions that you had on my little 15 minute live set, which I'll also link at the end of this video. So if you want to hear the final result of all the stuff I'm going to show you today, check the end of the video and there will be links there and maybe in the description as well. All that being said, let's dive into the circuits. So let's start off with the first track. Obviously I brought all that in way too quickly, but hopefully you can kind of see where we're ultimately heading. And the goal would be to build that up quite slowly over time to ratchet up the energy level one bit by bit. Let's break this down to the kick. And this kick has a good amount of distortion on it. So let me turn that off. This is a kick I got from Splice. I got a lot of the samples in this from Splice, to be honest. I really like the distortion on the rhythm. I've talked about it before. Someone very kindly asked how I got my drums to be so fat. This is the reason why. Adds that nice saturation and also kind of helps tame the low end of this really boomy kick a little bit. I also do like occasionally to add just a little bit of high pass filter to tame some low end because it's there. So that's the kick up next. You can hear that is pretty aggressively sidechained to the kick. That's going to be another running theme here of a lot of sidechained percussive elements. And here's the fun thing. Let's get rid of that reverb. Let's get rid of the slapback stereo delay. That's a kick, <laughs> a kick that I've basically turned into a cross stick. Originally, I was trying to make some kind of like rumble. Which, while that sounds kind of cool, it doesn't sound great. And so just messing up the sound. I don't remember exactly what my original settings were, but here we are. Get this percussive element, and then I layer that with... Also with a good amount of reverb on it. And these elements complement each other nicely, but uh, you can also have just one without the other. So you can use it to build a little bit of sonic interest. Very simple 909 ride. This hi-hat is sidechained to the kick, as you can probably hear. A lot of sounds on this track. A lot of the stuff I was listening to around the time that I made this has just all of these little bits of ear candy that all kind of accumulate for this patchwork of sonic interest and kind of little rhythmic treats for your ears. Using the sample flip feature on the circuit rhythm was super helpful here because you can switch between a bunch of different sounds all onto the same track, including setting the pitch of an individual step using uh, the keyboard. Also, this is, to pat myself on the back a little bit, kind of a feat of uh, workarounds. We got that. Pretty straightforward. Wait for it. For this right here, I am literally switching between the vocal sound and a blank step really quickly and then I had to speed the pattern up and so then I'm like buffering it with an extra pattern just to get that to work. 
And so then all together, these four patterns still take you through eight bars. I've also had a lot of success using those little lead in sounds, those go a really huge way towards making these loops feel kind of complete and keeping the energy moving along, especially when you switch from track to track. And I'll show you a couple more examples of that in a little bit. So for those of you keeping score, these are all of our kind of foundational elements. Plus our ear candy track. Now let's get some other elements going. like this little acid stab, which plays off of this pretty nicely. Both of those are sent to the reverb a bit, and then also quite a bit of distortion. So let me get rid of the reverb and the distortion. Both of those are going a really long way towards bringing these fairly static sounds a bit more to life. So all of this is going on on the circuit rhythm. Now, let's finally bring in the tracks, and I'm gonna mute everything but the kick, and then this synth one track. Most of these patches are by A Force Truly Evil, available on Isotonic, not an ad, but, uh, this guy's the goat of making the circuit track sound real nice. You can hear I have my own internal sidechain running on the tracks. Plus, this little ARP thing. With a good amount of ping pong delay on that. Which brings it to life quite a bit. So the idea is I start with this, I can slowly bring in elements, bring in that acid base, slowly filter in this little bass line, and I can kind of break stuff down, then introduce the bass line, then build it back up, break it down again, introduce the arpeggio, and now we're kind of at the peak of this section. So it's time to switch to the next project. Which introduces just one new element, but it goes a pretty long way. So this brings us to one of the things that I thought about a lot while making this set, and that is creating little moments. While I am not a professional music performer by any stretch of the imagination. One thing I tend to see in my fellow amateur music performances is just a lack of differentiation between different moments. So just a lot of noise at your face constantly with nothing for the listener's ear to grab onto because like the listeners never heard these songs before. They need variation and they need contrast. And so I tried to think of what are ways that I can create these just moments that get your adrenaline pumping that are very dramatic. And so one of them was to go to this breakdown. Let's filter this in. Let that ride. It's very dramatic. Uh, I think it's really fun. That's the kind of thing that hopefully makes your brain light up a little bit. And all the rest of this project is exactly the same as before, except I had to stack that little acid stab on this track instead of on track two, just because I needed to free this track up for this little stab. That's the original sound. So I've kind of reconstructed it, moved the start of it forward, Distort it to taste, reverb it. Sidechain it. And that's not exactly the setting I arrived at, but hopefully you get the idea. I was actually pretty aggressive with the distortion. Quite a bit of the sounds that you hear throughout the set have been altered in similar ways where I can get away with quite a bit of sonic manipulation, which is good because the amount of sounds I have access to is pretty limited. So, we've let this ride, we've built this back up. When this ARP is kind of at its peak, 
of the cutoff, we know we're basically ready to move on. And in this case, that transition basically kind of wrote itself because this was kind of a branching tree of ideas where I built up these basic elements that you've already heard and then started adding more stuff and then went, mm, not sure how I feel about that. Let me do a different version and add a bunch of other stuff. And then I realized, well, I like both of them and I can just use them both and they'll seamlessly transition into each other because it's a lot of the same elements. So you've already heard all of this stuff. So let's add some new stuff. More distortion and reverb. So with distortion and reverb, just a simple little part, kind of mirrored. More sample flip stuff. The reverb's helping me out quite a bit here. And it's sidechained to the kick. And you probably keep hearing that cross stick sound. That's actually coming from the tracks and it's got probability. So you are not going to hear it every time. There's one of them. <laughs> kind of a useless element, to be honest. Let me just get rid of that. So that reverb's giving these sounds some nice consistency that they were otherwise lacking, as is the side chain. And it's layered nicely with this part. You've heard this stuff. So now, to finally bring the tracks back into play. Simple little art part. And once again, I can mess with the filter cutoff to kind of control the dynamics, bring it in slowly over time, build back up to one more kind of peak of energy and use this track that I haven't yet talked about to control my energy level. So this is going throughout this entire track, this white noise whoosh and riser. And I talked about this in my previous video on making a set with these things. This goes a really long way towards helping make things feel cohesive and towards transitioning you between tracks where there are not a lot of shared elements. So check this out. This is how I'm going to transition between this track and ultimately this. Now, to be fair, they're at the same tempo. They're in the same genre. They have a similar vibe. So that's already pretty easy, but we don't have to just butt them up against each other. We can actually tie them together a little bit more and kind of work our way there. So here's what I did. First of all, at this point in the set, I've like built up to my big peak of energy. Now I'm just going to trigger the same project again, which is it's like most kind of broken down intro version. So wait for it. So it's kind of broken down. Use some elements, cut the lows. That's relatively smooth. So you can hear that white noise whoosh is also present in this new project. So that's a shared element. And then cutting out all the lows of this kick makes it a little less distinct. I mean, that was a little more abrupt the second time around, but it makes the transition between the two kicks less abrupt and kind of mimics what you would hear in like an actually DJed. DJ set. That's not the only thing I did to bridge tracks together over the course of this set, so I'll keep mentioning them as we go. But let's quickly talk about this kick is pretty much unmodified. You've heard this white noise whoosh, which is side-trained a little bit and reverbed a little bit. This little bass. That's pretty much stock and unmodified. Not a lot going on there. This little horn sound with similar processing to what you've already heard. With a little bit of delay on there. So then in context. Which 
which is kind of cheesy, but kind of fun. I'm definitely letting this be repetitive, but I've added those little tiny variations just to keep it interesting, especially that little turnaround right here. And that's what kind of lets you know that this loop has ended and you're ready for it to loop again. So now at this point, we've established our low end, our main little hooky element. Let's get a little bit fancier with the ride symbol. So this is fun. What I've done is gone to the velocity and I'm just alternating the higher and lower velocity on these steps. I've got the tiniest amount of reverb on this ride symbol. And then I'm side chaining it to the kick. And that became my technique for uh, ride cymbals for pretty much the rest of the set. This really nice pumping effect that I think is super hype and sounds pretty polished for a relatively budget hardware device. So we brought up our energy level, got some percussion. So I'm basically just leaning on my background as a drummer to go, let's just do something rhythmic and anytime there's silence, fill it. And you can hear a just whole whack of delay going on here. And that might be hard to demonstrate with it off because I have literally gone in and automated the delay for this track. You'll see it kind of fluctuate. Because for that little acid part, I don't want there to be a lot of delay. I want it to be very short and punchy. So I just had to go in and by ear, bring it back up. Turn it all the way down for that drum fill, just so I could stack as many little sounds, little bits of ear candy as possible onto one track. And I think that works pretty well, actually. I will mention getting stuff in key kind of a pain. So I spent a lot of time just like trying to dial sounds in by ear. And uh, I wouldn't wish that upon anyone, to be honest. And this is side change of the kick. Also, that drum fill you hear at the end is something I programmed myself like in my DAW and then brought into here just as one singular sound that I could then trigger. And just I need to be at the right tempo for that to work. More hi-hats with a little bit of side chain. I'm also automating the pitch of the hi-hats just a tiny bit, which is kind of a fun little detail. And you may have noticed the circuit tracks ain't doing nothing for this one. This is the circuit rhythm show all the way. So that's pretty much everything except for one more element, which is this. Hardware head. That's just a text to speech uh, program that I have then chopped up a little bit to align to the grid in my DAW, added some effects to, and then loaded it in here, knowing full well that I was gonna have it play back at 135 BPM, just like made for this set, basically. I actually did that quite a few times where I'd realize, oh, I need thus and such sounds. Let me plug my rhythm in, load up components, and then load a few more sounds in, swap out some sounds that I know for sure I'm not using, which is maybe a little tough because there's no way to like detect if a sound is unused in a project, so you just kind of have to remember, but hardware head that's kind of fun and that's sharing at the same track with our white noise whoosh so by this point i've introduced everything so we're ready to move on and i've swapped out some of my tracks for different elements has the uh, low pass filter automated, as you can probably hear. I'm just moving it back up and down and then reverb and delaying it a bit. That's too much. Side chaining it. I don't love the amount of mid range in this, but there's not really a way to deal with the mid range. So, so be it. Everything else is the same, but now I've introduced this rolling bass line. And actually this was a bit of working forwards and then working backwards because the next track in the set has a rolling bass line. So I basically got this track, track three, to this peak and then didn't really know what to do with it other than this other element that I have yet to unmute. And so I kind of moved on and then I was working on this track with the rolling bass line. 
And I thought, hey, I could connect these two. They already have the same kick just because I don't have very many kicks that I love loaded in on here. There are only a few techno kicks that I really, really liked and that really fit with what I was working on. So I was like, hey, I could give this a rolling bass line. That way, when I switch to this, we're already kind of used to hearing a rolling bass line. So that makes the transition a lot smoother. So once I'd worked backwards, we've got our little automated rolling bass line thing. And I bring in a new element. I'm still not 100% sure how I feel about this as a technique, to be honest, but I'm using polymeter. So this pattern is just a little bit shorter than all the other patterns. So it'll start at irregular times and take a pretty long time to repeat where it starts on this step. And I've heard people say like this can kind of reduce the repetitiveness of your track while allowing you to keep it fairly minimal. That's cool. I still get bored of this element pretty quickly, but it's definitely interesting to get it to not sound goofy as hell took some doing though, because here's what it used to sound like. <laughs> So in order to de-goofify it, let's distort it. And I'm using step automation in this case. So with this by itself, you can see this wildly bounce around. And it still sounds a little bit goofy, but uh, that's life. It's kind of hype. And then I can bring up the pitch right before I'm ready to switch projects to something else. So that's kind of my out for this element to resolve it. It's to bring it up as a riser. And since this also has a rolling bass line and the same kick and the same white noise whoosh, that transition is fairly seamless. Okay, we're going to bring the tracks back pretty soon, I promise. But first, uh, I'm not going to do that because we have to talk about the rolling bass line. Has some delay on it, which is quite nice. Let me turn that off. And just this woofy, boxy low end that I want to cut. A little bit of distortion. Fatten it up just a little bit. And then layer it with this. This is a saw wave, just like a basic saw wave, with some distortion and a bunch of the highs cut. And this is not doing as fast a pattern. Side chained. They sound pretty good together. And then I can layer that with another, uh, well, formerly a bass element. That's what it originally sounded like. So let's cut that low end, thicken up the sound, reverb it. Whoops. So all three of those tracks kind of constitute my bass. I should also take this opportunity to mention that I did make a concerted effort to keep my low end tuned properly. So you can hear if I distort this, that the kick and the sub bass are at the same pitch and distorting both elements like that. And maybe, hey, Pitching them up an octave can make that a little easier to detect and a little bit easier to tune by ear. I did that a lot for this. Very basic hi-hat. Very exciting. Let me get rid of the effects on this. I am benefiting a lot from the reverb and uh, ping pong delay here. Because by itself, it's just so static. So 
So I'll show you where this melody came from. This sample. I just wanna know. That I got off this place. And I also have that little lead in that I switch from. So I switch from the lead in. from like an unrelated vocal sample. So I have this melody kind of weave in and out to imitate the vocal. Which is kind of fun, maybe a bit much, but uh, I like it. That's the rhythm. So everything together real quick, just for those of you keeping score at home. But in the process of building this up, you'll notice that sounds kind of empty. And getting there too quickly is not all that satisfying. So. Let's bring in the tracks. Finally. So this patch is real nice. And I'm just playing one chord held down for a really long time. Let me get rid of my side chain. So I have this pattern set to be as slow as it can go. So you don't have to hear it re-trigger all that often. Side chaining that. So you'll notice I had this like going, but turned all the way down on the mixer. So I can just slowly bring it in. And once I've got everything playing and my synth pad at full volume, that's when I know I'm ready to go into like a full fledged breakdown to the next page. So I have to be quick on this because I have another scene I need to switch to. You can check out my video on combining both circuits if you are wondering why I have to switch scenes like this. It's long story short because switching projects when you have a long chord progression on the device that's being controlled can cause it to come in out of order. It's a weird bug and uh, I have no idea if Novation is going to fix it or not. That's why I have this little one bar kind of breakdown and that little speed up of the bass, which I just like did by ear. using micro steps and patience. So now I'm ready to introduce my full chord progression. So here's another kind of big dramatic moment that's kind of anthemic and is really fun. So here's the tracks doing that pad with really slow patterns. I've got this in chromatic mode, so I can do that. And then if I get rid of this for a second, you know, the white noise whoosh going. Some kind of fun stuff with this bass. Remember, two different bass elements layered. Got a riser. So bringing this back in, now I can go to the next thing. Bring the kick back. And then finally, bring in synth two on the tracks. So by itself, you get that reverb doing a lot of work. And what's really fun is then I originally was going to have the kick come back, but I decided against it in favor of just upping the reverb level on both tracks. So for instance, if I turn all this other stuff off and just bring up the reverb level on this pad, check out what it does to the sound. Makes it kind of larger than life. I can do the same with the lead. 
And once this is drowning in reverb, ready for another overly dramatic moment. And this is probably my favorite moment of the whole set. And we've basically switched songs. It's the same track, but we've gone through a dramatic switch up. So here's how I make that work. I've got tracks two kind of out of the equation for a while again. A snare track with some volume automation. Here's that by itself. And alternating velocities. Also, for whatever reason, I couldn't get the volume of this snare track to start at zero, hear how it starts off like a little bit loud and then jumps back down. That's why I cover it with the filter sweep, which also just works for that transition. So I'm not complaining. So that volume is being automated. And then I very deliberately only have one sound. And you can hear the sub bass cuts out pretty quickly. And it's got some reverb on it. And some lows are cut on this, remember. So you get this really staccato, short little sound. Perfect. To prime you for a really intense switch up. And so now we've switched kicks for one thing. And uh, there's a lot of shenanigans going on here. So this sound has been reverbed and delayed. And then I've automated its pitch in order to get it to do that little pitch sweep. That's just done by ear and it was really annoying to dial in. And then another ear candy track switching between multiple different sounds and that very much benefits from reverb and delay. The way that bass growl leads into the next loop of the track really works for me. Also, you can hear how silly and staccato this sounds. <laughs> this delay is the secret weapon, like seriously. So once again, these little whoosh and growl sounds leading into your next part go a really long way for the energy level, I feel. So that kick doesn't come in by itself, it's accompanied by this bass. Another case where it's pretty important for these to be in the same key. And this has like, not much processing. Little bit of distortion, it's not really doing much. And now I can start building my different percussion. So here's kind of another addition to the hi-hat lore. That's ongoing, obviously. So we've seen this, the little rocking back and forth velocity. Now I can add some delay. A little phasey, but bear with me. Some reverb. And side train it. That's pretty high. And this is just doing the want to know vocals again, because we're carrying that through. hi-hat. Okay, so this is kind of fun. This is where we've gone truly off the rails. And that lead in sound that little bass growl really just fits in this nice little pocket that I really like. But let me play the sound by itself. So this is not done using the keyboard. That's done automating the pitch by ear because I wanted it to do that little slide in line 
with uh, that big stab element. And I'm also automating the low pass filter up and down, down, back up, another sweep, giving a little bit of room for that vocal to breathe. And the nice thing is that I can basically hit you with this initial drop, build up the percussion for that, break that percussion down and then hit you with this lead element. And uh, the tracks is just sitting over here uh, being sad. Now, We've fully explored this idea, so we're ready for one more transition for the purpose of this little 15 minute set. We break this down. Just the kick, the ear candy elements, and way fewer of them, mind you. And the bass. So now, I start to ratchet up the tempo. I'll do it slowly. I'm aiming for 150. I'll get there when I get there. So you've gotten a little bit acclimated to that. We're going to keep going faster. Go for some more intensity. And now I can switch to the next project. This is probably the most premeditated transition of the entire set because once I finished this track, I was like, ooh, I'll bet I can harvest a bunch of these same elements for a tempo switch up to go to something faster and more intense, something a little more industrial y. And so I literally just did like a save as and then just started swapping out elements. So a lot of these things, the kick, the ride, the hi hat are the same. The bass element is also the same. Just doing a uh, much simpler part because it's going a lot faster. So then I've swapped out my stab for a different stab with a lovely over the top reverb and delay. Like the sound already has some reverb on it, but we can take that farther and then side train it. Swapped out my hi-hat and I'm going to bring this stuff in over time. And so some of these differences are totally fine. I'll get to that in a second. So here's another instance of using polymeter. Quite a bit simpler than the other example. And I think this maybe works a little bit better. Kind of a cool sound on its own, except it's kind of goofy. So I've messed with the start, messed with the filter, messed with the distortion, reverb and delay at this point. I have forgotten exactly where that sweet spot was, but we can get back. So you see how this is a different length than your normal 16 steps. So that's going to take a long time to repeat. And it's maybe a little disorienting, but for something with this kind of intensity, I think that kind of works. And you've got a bunch of other stuff for your ear to grab onto anyway. And while the rhythm is great for all these percussive elements, all these distorted elements, all the stuff that needs to be very rhythmic, well, rhythm and hit hard, it's not great for stuff that needs to evolve, or at least it's not always great for stuff that needs to evolve. So let's finally bring back in the tracks. So this patch is lots of fun because you can make the resonance really scream on this one. So I can bring up the resonance. I can bring up the filter. And I can mess with that, evolve it over time, take it to kind of a ridiculous degree. So with the kick, so I'll start with it down here and I kind of work my way up. And this can evolve and be kind of fun to listen to for quite a while especially with all this other stuff. Just these fun little pockets of low end. And once I've built this up to a ridiculous degree, I can break it back down. Just trigger the same project again so that I can now bring in this element. 
this fun little plinky guy. The really fun thing about this is that I'm now taking my use of the ping pong delay to yet another level of kind of chaos. Here's the sound by itself, by the way. Reverb. Delay. This nice rhythmic delay is really fun to just take up to unreasonable levels. Which by itself doesn't really make much sense, but with a kick to give some pulse. You just get this frenetic chaos that still makes sense. So to kind of take the track to its final uh, crescendo, if you want to call it that. Having everything going at once. Having my bass going. And really ratcheting up that delay is when you know you've hit your peak and everything is kind of too much. And that's when you break it back down. And in the case of the 15 minute set, I ended it there or I could choose to continue it. I was thinking of doing something where I then slow the pace way down, but uh, I'll get there. So hopefully this has answered most of the questions that people had in the comments of the full set of this. But to answer a couple of the other ones that didn't really fit in the context of this kind of walkthrough, someone asked how long I practiced this, if at all, a lot. And in fact, I basically practiced it as I was building it up. So I would, you know, kind of get a track going. I would test out different uh, arrangements, different song structures, different switch ups from track to track. And if I had specific moments that I really wanted to make sure I nailed, I practiced them as I went, tweaked them, practiced it again, kind of felt out how it worked, especially moments like build ups for dramatic moments took some finagling. So just in the process of making this set, I practiced it a lot. And then to actually perform it, I also practiced, like ran through the entire thing a few times until I could do it without any obvious mistakes. Like because I'm muting and unmuting tracks a lot and doing it on my own judgment in the moment, there's a little bit of improv involved, but like not much. The audience is not going to care if I don't nail the exact song structure I had in my head, but I wanted to get close. So I did spend quite a bit of time really trying to tweak the song structure I had. And of course, the big moments where there's a giant switch up or a big dramatic moment, I wanted to nail every single time. So I practiced it a lot. Someone else asked about this setup versus the setup I had where I was running the circuit tracks controlling the Roland MC-101. And I would say I actually have really grown to love this setup and I might have to revise my gear I'd never sell list a little bit because this setup is the one that I would perform live. In fact, I very intentionally tied the first set I did. So people who have been hanging around here for a bit might have seen this, where I eventually build up to this. I haven't worked out exactly how to transition those yet, but hopefully you see where I'm heading with this. I could do like a 30 minute long set with what I've built up on here, and I'm still not done adding to this thing. That's a tangent. Someone else asked how long of a set could you make? And I think if you made smart use of your projects and were okay with some repetitiveness, you could get an hour long set easy peasy, just with a lot of work to prepare that. Um, the original question though, this is great for something that's very rhythmic and percussive and danceable. The circuit tracks controlling the MC-101 is great for something like synthwave, something more melodic, something with more sonic evolution with these synths that take their time to kind of open up the filter cutoffs and all that kind of stuff. For different genres, I think you might be thinking about different setup combinations, although you could definitely do some cool kind of minimal or melodic techno with the tracks controlling an MC-101. It very much could be done, but for something this rhythmic with this many different little bits of moving parts and ear candy, this wins for me for that style. If you'd like to see the full one take live performance of the set that I just walked you through, you can check out this video up over here. And if you'd like a painfully deep dive into my adventures and misadventures combining both circuits, you can check this video out up over here. Thank you so much for watching and I'll be back with a new video in a little bit.